namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namaste. So, in the previous episode, we discussed how it's possible that even stream entry, the first path, realization, leads to actually a complete view of Nibbana, with nothing left out. Even though it's only temporary, huh? Still, it is the actual original Nibbana with full qualities. And after that experience, the sadhu is permanently changed. He's not anymore a mundane person, but he's actually sharing qualities with the divine. And from that, he moves forward more or less automatically to complete enlightenment. It just depends on how much effort he makes, how long it's going to take him. So we can look in the Shastras, in the Buddha Suttas, and we can see many stories of sadhus, monks, householders, and even young children, <laughs> illiterate people and so on, who attained stream entry by their association with the Buddha's teaching. And we can even find stories about monks or sadhus who attained arahant, or fourth path, just from a very short teaching by the Buddha. Now this all seems miraculous and amazing, except there's one thing missing that cannot be captured in any rendition or text, or accounting, verbal accounting of these incidents. And that is the presence of the Buddha, the presence of the enlightened one. And this makes all the difference. This makes it possible for people to understand the meaning of these short teachings, even within a few seconds because the presence of the Enlightened One is a certain kind of stillness, a certain kind of silence. The Enlightened One is not thinking. There are no influxes of views. There are no influxes of desires. And so on. His mind is completely quiet. So even though he may be acting, teaching, going here and there, offering advice, counseling people, and so on, still, actually, he himself is not doing anything. So this experience of being in the energy field of an enlightened being makes all the difference in how one can understand even a short teaching. For example, let's consider a legend. About 2,000 years ago, a king in Sri Lanka invaded India. And he had one soldier called Neela, and Neela was very, very strong. And the legend is that when this king wanted to go to India and invade, he had his soldier, Neela, smack the ocean with an iron bar. And because of that, there was created a land bridge. You can see a photo of it here. That enabled the soldiers to cross the ocean. Of course, in reality, the land bridge was already there because it had been built by Lord Rama many, many years before that. But anyway, it's a nice legend because why? The iron bar 
was struck so forcefully by Nila on the ocean that the, the waves parted uh, and, and the waters receded and one could see the bottom of the ocean. Now the same kind of thing happens when one is in the presence of an enlightened being like the Buddha or any of his top disciples. Because of the energy behind the words. It's like an, an iron bar is, is not very strong by itself. But when, can, when someone can put a lot of energy into it, it can even part the ocean. Uh, so a simple saying or a shloka or a few lines of verse can't have that much effect. But because the energy of the enlightened one is there, it parts all the influxes, all the sankharas, and one can actually get a glimpse directly of the meaning behind the verse. Strive forth and cut off the stream. Discard sense desires, O Brahmana. Having known the destruction of fabrications, become a knower of the unmade, O Brahmana. So this is the effect of even a short verse spoken by a realized being. Huh? It can cut through all the layers of fabrication, all the layers of made things, and reveal the unmade, the unfabricated, huh? behind it. So, just like Brahman in the Vedas, Nibbana is behind everything in the Buddha's teaching. It is the absolute. It is the source. And why do we leave Nibbana and come to this world? It's only because of ignorance and sense desires. So if we can cut through these fabrications, first of all, of ignorance, the delusion of thinking that we can be happy in this world of illusion and suffering, if we can cut through that ignorance of thinking somehow we can make an arrangement that will work, uh, that will make us happy, even though this world is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self, if we can cut through all that nonsense, then we can see the original, pure essence, Nibbana, or Brahman, as it's called in the Vedas. So there's another nice story about stream entry, immediate stream entry, regarding Sariputta. Now Sariputta was already a wandering monk. He was already a brilliant scholar and had a lot of popularity and followers and accolades. But he was still unsatisfied. He knew he had not yet attained the deathless, the unmade, the unfabricated. So one day he was going through the marketplace and he saw one of Buddha's disciples, Asadji. Asadji was one of the five original disciples of the Buddha. And Sariputta was so taken with Asadji's manner, his energy, his awareness and consciousness, that he said, oh, this is someone I have to take a lesson from. I'll follow him. And when he sits down after his alms taking, then I will converse with him and beg him to teach me. So that's what he did. He followed Asaji, and then he said, please teach me. Uh, who is your teacher and what is his teaching? And Asaji said, well, I'm just a new man. <laughs> I don't really know what I'm doing. And Sariputta said, but I can tell you have something special. Please share it with me. So Asaji said, whatever phenomena arise from cause, their cause and their cessation, such is the teaching of the Tathagata, the great contemplative. Now, immediately on hearing the first line, uh, not even the complete sutra, but just the first line, he attains 
stream entry because he was a man of great intelligence. And when he heard regarding all things that are caused, he knew there is also the uncaused. So the things that are caused come into being by dependent origination or dependent arising, paticca samupada. And because they have a cause, because they are conditioned like a fire, as long as a fire has fuel, as long as it has air, it'll continue to burn. But when the causes of its arising, when the fuel and air run out, the fire goes out, so we say. Does it really go anywhere? No. It just goes out of being because the conditions that caused it have ended. So in the same way, as soon as Sariputta heard regarding everything that has a cause, he knew, ah, simply remove the cause and that's the end of it. So just from this, he got the view of Nibbana. See, this is like the iron rod hitting the water, smack, <laughs> and the waves part. And ah, he sees the real thing, the uncaused, the unconditioned, the unfabricated, the unborn. Unborn. Ajatta. So he reaches the Ajatta Vada. He reaches Turiya consciousness. You see how this all ties together with the Vedic teaching? There's nothing out of order. Oh, but there's even a better example. There's the example of Bahya. Now, Bahya was, like Sariputta, already a renunciant, already a contemplative. And he was living by the ocean, and many people were coming and giving gifts and becoming his disciples and this and that. But still he felt a little bit incomplete. He knew he was on the path, but he needed someone to complete his teaching, to complete his sadhana. So when he heard about the Buddha, he immediately went to see him. And when he found the Buddha, the Buddha was on his alms round begging food. When Bahya approached him, please teach me the Dhamma. Buddha said, no, not right now. I'm on my alms round. But Bahya wouldn't give up. And he said, in this world, life is uncertain. Death is uncertain. Death can come at any time. So neither your life nor my life are secure. So please teach me right now. I beg you. So the Buddha relented. And he taught Bahya. And this is what he taught. You should train like this. In the scene will be merely the scene. In the herd will be merely the herd. In the thought will be merely the thought. In the known will be merely the known. That's how you should train. When you have trained in this way, you won't be by that. When you're not by that, you won't be in that. When you're not in that, you won't be in this world or the world beyond or in between the two. Just this is the end of suffering. So because Bahya's mind was already prepared by his previous sadhana and meditation, he immediately got Arhant. So I can imagine him sitting there with his mind blown. <laughs> I can remember when I got fourth path, my mind was so blown you couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> so Bahya was probably just sitting there like, wow, the Buddha left. And just a few minutes later, Bahya got up. I can imagine he was sort of staggering around Still going, oh, wow, you know. <laughs> and he came across a wild cow and her calf. 
And the cow charged him with her horns uh, and uh, killed him, gored him with her horns. So a few hours later, when the Buddha was with his disciples and he heard this, he simply smiled and he said, Bahya was astute. He practiced in line with the teachings and did not trouble me about the teachings. Bahya of the bark cloth has become fully extinguished. Where water and earth, fire and air find no footing, there no star does shine, nor does the sun shed its light. There the moon glows not, yet no darkness is found. And when a sage, a brahmana, finds understanding through their own sagacity, then from forms and formless, from pleasure and pain, they are released. So this release from the dichotomies of existence, this is Nibbana. This is full enlightenment. This is what is seen when in the presence of an enlightened being. This is what is known when the mind is touched by deep silence. This is the essence of Nibbana and complete self-realization. Aum Tatsat, Aum Shakti, Aum.